If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It is not arrogant. Or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it rejoices with truth. Love bears all things. Believes <laughs> all things. Hopes all things. <laughs> Endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then, face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three. But the greatest of these is love. 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 Well, I would guess that at least some of you have spent several Sunday evenings over the past month or so watching The Last Dance, now, that 10-hour documentary about the Michael Jordan-era Chicago Bulls, a team that many believe might be the greatest team ever assembled. And you know, as sports fans, we like to sort of argue about that kind of thing, right? Who's the greatest this or that? Who's the greatest team? Who's the greatest player? Who's the greatest golfer? And on and on it goes. So I thought this morning we would start with our own little who's the greatest poll. I'm going to ask you three questions. You can answer right there at home with whoever you're watching this service with. First question, who is the greatest American male athlete of the past 100 years? I'm going to give you three choices. Babe Ruth, Michael Jordan, or Muhammad Ali. So go ahead and argue it out right there in your living room or family room. I'll wait until you have an answer. Okay, who'd you choose? Next question, who's the greatest comic book superhero of all time? Again, I'm going to give you three choices. Superman, Batman, or Spider-Man. Now, how many of you would choose Superman? I mean, he could fly, bullets bounced off him, he had x-ray vision. That's a pretty, pretty good skill set, in my opinion. Or would you choose Batman? He had a cool utility belt, good with tools, uh, he drove an awesome car. Or maybe Spider-Man. He did that Spidey thing, um, had a really cool British accent, at least our Spider-Man does. Which one would you choose? Last question, this is a fun one. Which is the greatest breakfast cereal of all time? A couple of my sons spent some of their quarantine time debating this very significant and important question, and they came down to these three finalists. Cinnamon Toast Crunch, Honey Bunches of Oats, and Captain Crunchberry. So for your last breakfast on earth, which would you choose? Now, personally, I can't believe that alphabets didn't make the list. I mean, really? But what if the question was not about a person or a superhero or even a breakfast cereal? What if the question is about a spiritual virtue? What if we ask, which is greater, faith, hope, or love? Now, today we wrap up our series on 1 Corinthians chapter 13 called The Greatest of These. And we've been studying this chapter where Paul spends a whole chapter teaching the ancient, Corin uh, ancient um, Corinthians and us about love. Now, we know human beings have always been fascinated with love. Many of the popular songs we listen to are about love. Way back in the 60s, the Beatles' greatest, one of their greatest hits was All You Need Is Love. A lot of the movies we watch are also about love, from Gone with the Wind to Casablanca, even to Rocky. I mean, Rocky wasn't really about a boxing, at least not the first one. It was a love story. And all these films and songs are about a kind of love that we would call romantic love. This powerful feeling generated by attraction, a powerful emotion that is sometimes based on neediness and often can be quite selfish in nature. 
But the word Paul uses is different. He uses the word agape, which points us to a very different kind of love. And here's the definition we've used throughout this series. Love is acting to bring about the well-being of another, no matter how they respond or how much it costs. Let me say that again. Love is acting to bring about the well-being of another, no matter how they respond or how much it costs. And this is the love Jesus taught us when he said, love your neighbors as yourself. It's the love Jesus taught when he said, love your enemy. It's the love Jesus demonstrated from the cross when he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. This is a revolutionary kind of love. It's a kind of love that transforms people and changes the world. And it's a kind of love that our world and our nation so desperately need right now. So far, we've seen Paul uses a whole string of descriptive phrases, 16 in all, to teach us about what love is and what love is not, what love does and what love does not do. And now we come to the very end of the chapter, the very last verse, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13. Let me read it for you. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, I know many of us have heard this verse many, many times, but I think it raises two questions that I want to deal with this morning. First, what does Paul mean by faith, hope, and love abide? It's an interesting word. We're going to take a look at that word. And what does he mean when he says that love is greater than both faith and hope? Well, let's begin with this. First, these three abide. These three abide. Well, three of our four sons have attended college in Indiana, and we've made well over 100 trips uh, to watch various basketball and baseball games. Uh, And much of the route we take to get to those schools is rural. We pass by dozens of small family farms, many of which have really old barns that are in disrepair or have already collapsed. And whenever I see these old barns, I, I feel a tinge of sadness because I think about uh, those barns when they were brand new and how they brought hope and promise to a farmer and his family. But they don't last. Uh, They fall apart. They break down over time. Or consider the ruins of ancient Ephesus, a city much like ancient Corinth. I took this photo last summer when I had the chance to visit this great open-air theater in the site of ancient Ephesus. It once held over 20,000 people. It's actually mentioned in the book of Acts chapter 19. It was made of stone and marble by the Romans. And while the ruins remain, they're just ruins. The theater itself didn't last. Here Paul says, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. Now the word abide is a translation of the Greek word mene, which means to stay or remain. It means to endure. Now to understand what Paul means here by saying this, we have to remember that he has been teaching in this letter about uh, spiritual gifts in the church. Back in chapter 12, Paul wrote, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. In verse 4, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. Notice, to each... To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now, I want to point out a couple of things here. Uh, Paul has been teaching uh, how spiritual gifts are for the building of the church. Uh, He has taught that the Holy Spirit has given gifts to the church, gifts like preaching and teaching and leadership and administration and service and mercy and prayer and many, many others. And this means that the church in Corinth and the church right here at Chapel Street is full of spiritual gifts. But then he says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. He's telling us that these gifts come to the church through people. This means that the church, that Chapel Street, is full of spiritually gifted people. Paul is teaching us that if you put your faith in Jesus, when you put your faith in Jesus, you receive the gift of salvation. And that includes the gift of a new heart. It includes the gift of new identity. 
It includes the gift of a new purpose and that the Holy Spirit has given you a spiritual gift or spiritual gifts to use for his great purpose in and through the church. It means that you are spiritually gifted. Now, I know that right now many of you have just said to yourselves, well, I don't think of myself as being gifted really in any way. That's, that's for the other people, the people who are really gifted, the people who preach or teach or sing like Ali or, or play instruments like Anton. Those are the gifted people. I'm just sort of an ordinary person. We tend to think of it like, you know, the gifted class in school. That's where, that's where the best and the brightest go. The rest of us just stay in normal class. But that's not so. That's not the way God teaches us. This, we, the church, are the gifted class. Don't let anyone ever tell you that you're not gifted. And never tell yourself that you're not spiritually gifted because you are. God says you are. And then Paul says at the end of chapter 12, something very interesting. He writes in verse 31, but earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. So Paul follows all this teaching about how important the spiritual gifts are with the chapter we've been studying for six weeks, 1 Corinthians 13. And in 1 Corinthians 13, he reminds us that while all these gifts are important, are, are to be used to build the church, that without love, they amount to nothing. Let's go back to the very beginning of chapter 13 we looked at a few weeks ago. Paul writes, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, if I have the spiritual gift of being able to speak in unknown languages, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers, the gift of prophecy, the gift of being able to proclaim God's word boldly and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have the gift of knowledge or teaching, and if I have all faith, the gift of extraordinary faith, so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, the gift of extraordinary generosity, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, I might call that the gift of martyrdom, but have not love, I gain nothing. So he's saying the more excellent way is the way of love. He gets to the end of chapter 13 now and says, so now faith, hope, and love abide these three. So what does he mean? Paul is saying that the time is coming when all the spiritual gifts will pass away. In verse 8 that we looked at a few weeks ago, he said, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. And all these will pass away because they will no longer be needed. Now, why is that? Verse 12, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part that I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Now what's Paul talking about here? He says, we will see face to face. Who? Whose face will we see? We'll see the face of Jesus. He says, we shall know fully. Know who? Know what? We'll know Jesus fully. We shall be fully known. By whom will, be, will we be known fully? Again, we'll be known by Jesus. He's talking about eternity here. The new heaven and new earth, the very presence of Christ himself, and the spiritual gifts at that time will no longer be needed because the church is no longer being built. The church will have been fulfilled as the bride of Christ. And on that day, Paul says, only faith, hope, and love will remain, will abide, will endure. Faith abides because even though we will see Jesus, we will not stop trusting in him. Hope abides because even though our hope will be realized, we will continue to hope in him, in his eternal reign in the new heaven and new earth. And love abides because love is the greatest of these. And that leads me to the second thing I want to talk about this morning. The greatest of these is love. Long, long time ago when we just had three young sons, uh, now we have four not so young sons, I had all three with me on a trip to the mall. Remember malls back in the day? I was pushing the youngest in a stroller. He was one or just under one. I had the two others with me, a six-year-old and a four-year-old. Uh, and as I recall, we walked into a store in the mall. I think it was a sporting goods store and I just started looking at stuff. 
And I might have gotten distracted looking at shoes or something. I don't remember how long went by. Not real long. But I went to gather up the boys and take them to another store. I noticed that uh, one of them was missing. The middle son was missing, the four-year-old. Now, two out of three isn't bad, uh, unless you're talking about your children. At first, I just assumed maybe he'd wandered into a different part of that, that one little store, a different aisle. So we walked around to a different aisle, and no luck. Walked to another aisle, no luck. Well, maybe he's gone out into the concourse to sit down because he got tired of waiting for dad. So I walked out in the concourse, pushing the stroller, dragging the other one with me. I looked up and down, and my son isn't out there. Now, if you're a parent, you know that right about then, my heart started to beat a little faster. Adrenaline started to pump a little bit more. Why? Because I've seen the TV shows, I've read the articles, I know that there's all kinds of bad things out there, so I started to move a little faster. I thought, I'd, maybe I'll just go to the next door and the next door. So I, I'm pushing the cart and dragging the other boys with me, and, and I didn't care if I looked funny, I didn't care what people thought, because my son was lost and he might be in danger. But just as I got to about the second store down, this kind security uh, officer walked out holding my missing son by the hand. He said, this your son, sir? I said, yes, it is. And everything relaxed and everything was fine. But the truth is, had that security guard not found him, I was prepared to race through every store in that mall. I could have, would have gone through every bathroom, every movie theater, every restaurant. I would have tipped over every rack of clothes if I had to. Why? Because my son was lost and I love my son. I would have had faith that I maybe could find him. I would have hoped that I would find him, but love is what compelled me to act. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells a well-known story about a shepherd who has 100 sheep. One night he's counting them all as I come back to the fold, and he counts out 99, one's missing. Now that's 99 out of 100, that's pretty good. Way better than two out of three but it's not good enough for this shepherd. He goes back out and he searches and searches and searches until he finds that one lost sheep. Why? Same reason, love. And that, by the way, is how much God loves you. Paul writes, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. So how can Paul say so clearly that love is greater than both faith and hope? Now, first notice, Paul's not saying that faith and hope are not important. They are important. They're central and they're foundational to our relationship with God. But he is saying that love is greater. Love is greater because faith without hope, excuse me, faith without love can become judgmental and cruel. Paul saw that in his own life before he knew Jesus. We see it around us all the time in religious conflicts in the world. James said that faith without deeds, that is, faith without loving action, is dead. Love is greater than hope because hope without love can become selfish. Let me explain. Uh, let's say my wife and I finished dinner one night and um, we're thinking about some dessert. But I happen to know there's one piece of peanut butter pie, my favorite, left in the, in the refrigerator in the garage. Now, I'm looking forward to that peanut butter pie. I've looked forward to it all day. I'm hoping, I'm hoping in that peanut butter pie, but I can have a choice to make. I can keep that hope to myself or I can share that hope with my wife and sell it for half of a piece of peanut butter pie. You see, if I keep my hope to myself, I don't have to share it with you or anyone. Hope without love can become selfish. But Paul is te teaching that love is greater than hope for two main reasons. First, love is the very nature and character of God himself. John the Apostle writes in 1 John chapter 4, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. He does not say God is faith. He does not say God is hope. He says God is love. But what kind of love? Well, John continues. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, 
but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or sacrifice for our sins. You hear it? This is love that gives itself sacrificially for the benefit of another, no matter what the response or what the cost. Secondly, love is greater than faith and hope because love is always for the other. Love is always for the other. See, I can have a faith that benefits me. I can have a hope that benefits primarily me. But I cannot, by definition, have a love that primarily benefits me because love is always about the other. In the summer of 1982, I spent seven weeks as an intern in a church in inner city Pittsburgh, and I've shared this story many times on occasions in the past, and you may recognize parts of it. This was well before I went to seminary, before I knew clearly that I was being called to become a pastor. I spent most of my time that summer trying to build a little Bible club among the refugee children that lived in the slums that were pretty close to where this church was located. These were kids from Southeast Asia. They were Hmong kids from Hmong families. Now, the Hmong people lived in Laos and Cambodia and fled their, their, uh, their homelands during the wars that ravaged their countries in the late 60s and the early 70s. And they live now in P inner city Pittsburgh in tenement housing under conditions that were so, so bad that the cockroaches actually make a difference, made a difference in their food supply. Uh, a Hmong mother one day took me to her apartment, showed me uh, a loaf of bread. It was actually half a loaf of bread because during one night, the cockroaches ate half a loaf of bread. So at night, the Hmong women and children would go to the city parks, and for hours and hours, they would dig up earthworms from these city parks because they learned that they could sell them a gallon of earthworms for $7 as bait down at the docks. Now imagine how many earthworms it takes to fill a gallon jug. Well, they needed the money, so that's what they did. Well, one of the kids I met that summer was a 14-year-old boy named Neng. Uh, Neng was very small in stature. I mean, he looked to me to be about 10 years old, but he was really 14. But even though he was small, Neng was, he was kind of big trouble. He was loud and disrespectful. He was angry. Uh, he was often profane, would shout out curse words just to get attention. And when he came to the group, he always disrupted things for everyone. And I really kind of wanted him to stop coming. But Instead, I decided to try to get to know him if I could. Well, gradually, very gradually, I learned something of this, this young boy's story. When he was 10 years old, he saw his father shot to death right in front of him by the Viet Cong. When he was 12, he and his family escaped the Viet Cong by swimming across the Mekong River under a hail of gunfire. The Mekong River was over two miles wide where they swam across. He said he swam until he coughed up blood. When I was 12 years old, I was playing Little League Baseball. So I started to understand some of Neng's anger and his pain. And very, very slowly, he began to trust me, and we became friends. So fast forward seven weeks to my very last night in Pittsburgh. We got some ice cream as a group and had a little party and said all our goodbyes, and then all the kids went home to their, their tenement apartments, and I went up to my apartment in the second floor of the church just to finish packing because the next day I was moving on with my life. But about 10 o'clock at night, long after everyone had gone, uh, I was packing, and I heard... My, my name being yelled from the sidewalk outside the church. Brian! Brian! And I recognized the voice. It was Neng. What is he doing here? It's too late for him to be here. So I went down to see what he wanted. When I went down, Neng was sitting on his little Stingray bicycle, baseball hat pulled down low over his face. And I said, Neng, what's up? What, what do you need? It's late. And then he took a little envelope out of his pocket. And he gave it to me. And he said, this for you. Maybe you buy some food, he said. He jumped on his bike and rode away into the night. And I stood there a long time, afraid to open the envelope, because I knew what I might find. What I found was a $10 bill. Just $10. But I knew what it had cost my little friend. That's a gallon and a half of earthworms. And in some ways, that $10 helped clarify God's call on my life. And after 38 years, 
I cannot retell that story without emotion because that's what love does. Love abides. Love remains. And love is the greatest of these. Lord, how we thank you for this extraordinary chapter in your word. Words written nearly 2,000 years ago to a different church, a different people, at a different time, in a different culture. But words that still ring so true today. We live in a world that talks a lot about love, but doesn't seem to know how to love. And teach us, teach us to be a church Teach us to be people who don't just use our gifts to build a church, but teach us to be people of great faith. But more than great faith, teach us to be people of great hope. And more than hope, teach us to be people of great love. Because love abides, and love is the greatest of these. Amen.